Hello, everybody. Uh, 9-11. There goes my monetization. Um, today we're going to talk about 9-11, which was the 9-11 for millennials. And in many ways, it was the defining moment that set off the 21st century. Uh, I don't know if the fullness of time will bear this out entirely, but there was a growing idea that it would be considered the beginning of the 21st century in the same way that the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand would define the, the 20th. For those who don't know, the very quick TLDR is that 9-11 uh, was a terrorist attack that happened in uh, the United States, primarily in New York City and in Washington, D.C. and Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where uh, trained Al-Qaeda hijackers hijacked four airplanes and crashed them into a Pentagon and the two World Trade Center towers. One that was reportedly heading to uh, Congress crashed because the people on the plane actually overpowered their captors. None of the people on any of the planes survived and in the attacks they did massive damage to the Pentagon and the World Trade Center towers were destroyed. In the end, nearly 3,000 people lost their lives and in the political fallout of such an event, the U.S. found itself on a campaign of expansionist wars across uh, the Middle East and uh, even to Central Asia, where they underwent some of the most disastrous wars in the country's history, which they're just now starting to come back from with their tail between their legs. But as with any great moments of American cultural trauma, from minutes after the attacks happened, there were elaborate conspiracy theories built up around what actually happened on 9-11. And in the fertile ground of the early internet, it became a lot more ubiquitous than, say, uh, more you know, older conspiracy theories. The best comparison would probably be the JFK assassination, in which it was another big, uh, you know, traumatic moment for Americans. And in so uh, has developed a also like large and elaborate conspiracy theory movement around it as well. So this is a common refrain in American discourse. And while I couldn't find any studies that showed how prevalent belief in what I'm going to call the 9-11 truth movement in uh, modern day is, there was one study that I could find from 2006, which is a long time ago. Uh, it's the year I graduated high school. That's how long ago it was. Holy oh, shit, I'm old. <laughs> but that poll showed that as many as one in three Americans believed in the 9-11 truth movement. Now, I suspect that after Obama got elected and it was no longer a sort of statement against Bush and Bush's wars of expansion in uh, Asia, that it probably died down or belief died down in it quite a bit. But I think the fact that Bush did 9-11 is still a pretty big meme in the discourse. And uh, if you were to get drinks into a lot of people, I think they would still fess up to thinking that it was an inside job. And for you real old heads that step back, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Tristan, you've made this video before. In September of 2016, you talked about this in a video when you still used uh, cardboard cutout drawings, like the sort of South Parkified version of yourself. What's the deal with this? And that is that it is Step Back's seventh birthday uh, on September 17th. And the tradition in that this is the second year that I've done it, but I plan to keep going forward. On Step Back's birthday, what I do is I revisit one of my old videos that I think either needs a reevaluation or elaboration or just needs a better version of it. And I do that. And that's what this is. So, Let's dive into the 9-11 truth movement. And now that I'm a semi-professional uh, conspiracy theory debunker, let's, let's de some bunk. But first, let's get into the uh, main two flavors that conspiracy theorists believe that would get the U.S. to want to kill 3,000 of its own citizens. The first one comes from PNAC, which is the Project for a New American Century, which was essentially a neocon white paper outlining what they thought the U.S. should do in the years to come when it came to their international politics and their uh, military stance. Now, neocons are essentially the, the hawkish part of the Republican Party, and all of the major thinkers were essentially all of the head honchos in the Bush administration. For example, a lot of it was inspired by a 1992 defense strategy laid out by Paul Wolfowitz uh, for then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, both of which would then play a large role in George Bush Jr.'s government in the 2000s. So to say that these people and these ideas were influential over uh, the Bush administration would be a gross understatement. Now, I'm not here to defend the Project for a New American Century. It is a despicable document that outlines a concept of the United States as essentially 
a global imperial hegemon. And those aren't my words. Those actually come from Andrew Basevich, who is an extremely renowned historian of American foreign policy. But one of the things that's in the Project for a New American Century is this idea that the military needs to be transformed. Essentially, the military still stood at a Cold War stance in which everything was prepared for countering the Soviet Union in its various things that were going on in the world, basically countering communism. And in a post-Soviet world with an idea of America being this sort of imperial hegemon, the needs and structure of the military would need to change because they would be more focused on local uh, revolts against their rule in various countries around the world. So the U.S. military needed to be designed more for uh, local conflicts in small wars across the world. So that little chunk was taken out of context by conspiracy theorists to push that this is the motivation that they want to use this to transform the military to become this emperor that they want to be. Problem is, it's extremely taken out of context and the Project for New American Century talks a lot more about this being a decades long process to transform the military. And as we even saw in the US's uh, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, they weren't prepared for this. They did not make the transitions they needed. And in doing so, uh, the US military failed hard. And also to outline this idea in a document like this would mean that at least one of two things would have to be the case. Uh, one, that they stated openly and publicly and tried to get attention towards uh, them openly stating the massive and huge black ops operation that they wanted to do, or two, that they were so hyper competent that they could plan uh, what would amount to the most complex black ops operation ever done in human history in less than a year, about a year. Like Al Qaeda planning 9-11 was relatively simple because they did not have to do a massive cover-up operation that would be the largest ever done by anyone ever. And even that took several years to train people and to prepare and get all the pieces in place so that you could do it. To do something that huge that fast would probably require a lot of people and a lot of money. Uh, money that probably would have been traced by now and p so many people that just by the laws of how humans work, something would have leaked by now. For some other people who are a little bit further down the rabbit hole, they thought that this was all part of the New World Order conspiracy, which is sort of a meta conspiracy that was really pushed by uh, radio show host Alex Jones, who uh, we are all now uh, dismally and painfully aware of today, um, the show being, of course, Infowars. The thing, though, is that Alex Jones in the early 2000s um, wasn't known for just being a reactionary right-wing weirdo. He actually had a little bit of counterculture cred in like, you know, the early 2000s. So um, there were like, you know, liberals and stuff like that who kind of took him seriously if they were more conspiratorially inclined. But as I mentioned in a video I did last year on um, the early 1990s and the white power movement, the New World Order conspiracy theory is only a uh, slightly sanitized version of what's called Zog. Uh, which is a conspiracy of the Zionist occupational government, which is essentially anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that is pushed in a lot of neo-Nazi and Klansman circles. And so when you're dealing with the New World Order, you're kind of in that space. But also the New World Order uh, peaked years ago and it doesn't really have a whole lot of believers today. If you really want something that is comparable, the modern day version of the New World Order would almost definitely be QAnon. So there's various different lines of conspiracy that we need to pick apart. Let's start with the idea that the United States had foreknowledge or that somebody, a, a them of some kind, had foreknowledge of the events and either chose not to act on it or uh, didn't act on it because they were behind it all. Now, the first major claim that you might be aware of is that there's some evidence of foreknowledge of the 9-11 attacks if you look at the stock market. I know. Hear me out. The claim goes that American Airlines, United Airlines, the two airlines involved with 9-11, had a whole lot of put options put on them in the stock market, which is uh, essentially a financial instrument that uh, you get money if their stock goes down instead of up. And the part that makes this conspiracy very interesting is that it is actually true. 
Uh, there were uh, over 5,000 put and call options put on these two airlines in uh, the dates of September 6th and September 7th, a suspicious amount. And it wasn't just limited to the airlines. Citigroup, which reportedly had to pay out as much as $500 million to these airlines in insurance claims, also had a lot of suspicious activity put on their stocks in the days leading up to 9-11. Furthermore, Citigroup actually had offices in the World Trade Center, which you can imagine would have uh, caused a blow to their stock price. This is all very suspicious. So suspicious that the government investigated it themselves. Because in the name of counterterrorism, they thought that this might actually be evidence that uh, there were people in this field who had uh, financial ties to Al-Qaeda and were um, looking to profit off of the terrorist attack. Now, the factors that caused all of these options to happen are actually quite numerous and a little bit complicated, but in the sort of sussing out, a lot of them were found to be rather innocuous. Uh, one example, though, that would sort of give you an idea of the kind of things going on is that there was a bunch of suspicious trading that happened on American Airlines, specifically on September 10th. And uh, the reasoning behind it was traced back to a September 9th newsletter that had been faxed out to a bunch of trading firms that was essentially like a hot stock tips uh, thing that predicted that these airlines were going to go down. And that led to sort of a runaway effect of a bunch of people putting in these options because they were just following the advice of the newsletter. The other major claim that uh, implies that America had foreknowledge of it was that the U.S. air defense basically had stood down on 9-11 and there were uh, no uh, air defense planes protecting the United States or that NORAD, which is in charge of American air defense, uh, intentionally scrambled the jets late in order to uh, make sure that 9-11 happened. Now, this makes two very fast assumptions about what was going on with NORAD at the time. One, that they had the capacity to track these airplanes as locations and where they were at any time. And two, that they found out about the hijacking in enough time that they could have scrambled the jets to do something. So let's get into both of those claims. One, uh, NORAD actually did have a lot of problems locating these planes. The way that we track where airplanes are at any given time is that they have something on them called a board transponder, which is sort of like a little radio beacon that tells them where they are at any given time, you know, to prevent crashes and to manage air traffic. Turns out though, that the 9-11 hijackers weren't just improv it. And one of the first things they did when they took over the plane was turn this off, which essentially meant that they had to find these planes with just their radar, which is a lot harder. And it was this idea that NORAD intentionally did not have the resources to deal with it, uh, saying that there were only 14 uh, fighter jets on uh, alert at that point. The main reason for this is that before 9-11, there had not been a plane hijacking in the United States since 1979. Furthermore, there was no concept that they would use these planes as weapons, like as battering rams to essentially commit their terrorist attacks. That was not a thing that had happened before. It was sort of a stroke of genius on uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's part for architecting that. So even if there was a hijacking, the idea of scrambling the jets to take the plane down wasn't so much what their response would be. They would mostly think of it as like a hostage situation in which they'd be sending in negotiators and trying to save the passengers on board. So things were slow because the air traffic controllers literally had to call NORAD up on the phone and let them know what was going on. There had only ever been one case in the decade before 9-11 of there being an air interception from NORAD, and it was a uh, civilian chartered aircraft who had Payne Stewart, who was, I guess, a golfer on board. And to intercept that plane took an hour and 19 minutes. And the reason it was so slow and why response was so slow on 9-11 was not only because of communications delays, but because there was actually a rule in place that barred using supersonic speeds on uh, these interceptions. Mostly because NORAD's preparations focused entirely on what are called ADIS or air defense zones. And the one that they were focused on was an offshore one because they assumed that anything they would need to intercept would be something that came from overseas. They didn't expect it to happen on a domestic flight. They didn't make a domestic air defense zone until after 9-11 as a response to 9-11. <laughs> 
So because of all of these factors, the window they had to respond to the hijackings was very small. The longest time they had to respond was Flight 11, in which they had about eight minutes before it crashed into the World Trade Center. In the case of Flight 175, the FAA informed NORAD that the plane had been hijacked around the time it crashed into the South Tower. So this looks pretty bad. In fact, one of the major things that the 9-11 Commission was designed to do was uh, figure out all of the holes in American air defense that led to 9-11 happening and tried to close them up. Because 9-11 exposed that America's uh, domestic defense was very bad. <laughs> so that's all the stuff about responding to the hijacked airplanes. But the other major conspiracy claim is that the planes either didn't exist or they were not the cause of effect of the taking down of the World Trade Center. There's a whole developed conspiracy theory that the World Trade Center, including the two main twin towers, as well as Building 7, were taken down in a controlled demolition. And there actually are several high profile people, some of which are even engineers and architects, who claim that they believe that the World Trade Center had been brought down by controlled demolition. I just looked it up. The engineer that they cite is actually a uh, software engineer. I just misread it. But essentially what it comes down to is the belief that the airplane crashes alone would not be sufficient to take down these buildings. They believe that the buildings were brought down using explosives made from either thermite or nanothermite, uh, mostly because there were trace elements of thermite found in uh, the dust and debris at the World Trade Center. So I'll go with the big answer first that uh, that kind of raises some questions to the Alex Jones types who talk about this uh, before getting into the nitty gritty because with these people, you need to get into the nitty gritty. But the main thing is that in order to set up a controlled demolition, you need um, a lot of time. Uh, installing explosives in a building, especially one as large as the two World Trade Center buildings, would have taken weeks and is an extremely noisy process in which there would have been a lot of people in uniforms going all around the buildings and being in places where they probably shouldn't installing all of this. Uh, a thing that there is no evidence that anybody heard or saw anything about this. So what is thermite? Thermite is essentially uh, a mix of a powdered metal and iron oxide that uh, rapidly oxidizes when uh, triggered. Essentially, it, it burns really, really hot and really intensely for a very short amount of time. Most of them aren't explosive. It's more often used for things like welding or for, uh, in the case of military operations, you'd like put some on the hood of a car and it would get so hot that it could like melt through the engine and you could disable that car very easily. But it can be explosive in a sense in that like another rapid oxidization uh, thing would be like black powder and that you can see it all go up at once which can have an explosion-like effect. The problems begin at the cleanup of the debris at the uh, World Trade Center site. Obviously, when you're uh, dealing with the debris that's left over from uh, 200 plus story skyscrapers falling down, you're gonna need to bring in demolitions experts in order to clean that mess up. And uh, none of them report seeing any signs of thermite being used at this site. And it would have been easy to find too, because in order to use enough thermite to take down these towers, you would have had to use a ton of it in order to do so. So there would have been a lot more evidence of thermite uh, being at the site or signs of thermite being used. Unless you're Alex Jones, I guess, who said that they used super thermite. <laughs> so then that gets to the whole finding of thermite particles on beams and tools used at the wreckage site. So then one of the best pieces of evidence that they would have then is that there was uh, trace amounts of thermite found on some beams uh, from the wreckage of the World Trade Center. The major problem with this claim is that they put no effort into um, figuring out where any of the tools that were used to get these pieces of metal cut out uh, would have been. Anything like an acetylene torch or a grinder or a cutter, or any of those sort of construction tools have many reasons why uh, thermite or something like thermite could have been on them. It could either have been on the tool because of contamination from a previous site. It could have gotten onto the tools, say, when they were in storage in some way. They could have even been exposed to it while moving the beams from ground zero to one of the testing sites or one of the memorials. Also, in the details of these tests that found thermite, they claim what they found, they found thermotic stuff because they found iron oxide 
and aluminum. The problem is that these two substances are found in a lot of things that are common in the World Trade Center building. One major thing that might have been a more likely thing to find in the ruins of an office building than thermite is that it could have been primer paint. It also is contradicted by a study by the U.S. Geological Survey that did not find trace amounts of thermite on the debris at the site, or any explosives at all for that matter. Another problem is that thermite is not exactly a great uh, substance to use in a demolition. I got a lot of for that in my 2016 video, but it still stands up because thermite is powerful. It is hot. It's not fast. And it moves in a specific downward direction, which means that if you want to use thermite to say, take out a steel beam or something like that, uh, you're going to have issues with like drips of liquid metal going down the side. And uh, it will be hard to really make a clean cut. Uh, if you want to cut metal with thermite, you really have to have gravity help you out and put it on sort of like a uh, flat surface and put it down and it melts down through it. That's where it's really, that's where it really shines. So not only is it not great for taking down very vertical structures, but also uh, the reactions are just too slow to do what it would need to do if it were responsible for the 9-11 attacks. And there's actually a really great case study uh, just showing this, which was done by, of all people, famed conspiracy theorist and 9-11 truther himself, Jesse Ventura. Ventura hired a tech from uh, New Mexico to essentially uh, prove that you can do demolitions with, uh, with thermite. And he got some nano thermite and put it on the steel beam, even, uh, even though he had it, um, like he had the steel beam horizontal, so gravity would have helped him in this situation. Uh, when they ignited the thermite, it created a lot of fire and a lot of smoke, but actually the beam itself um, did not get damaged enough. It didn't go through it. <laughs> Another claim that's used to bolster up the thermite theory is that there were pools of molten steel found in the bedrock at ground zero, a thing that I have not been able to find any reputable evidence of. <laughs> and it's not exactly a thing that would have gone under the radar. If they had found molten steel, it would have damaged any of the tools that were used to excavate the site, which means that they would have had to do all sorts of special uh, methods for dealing with that, which would have been a major hazard, which would have at least been written about. So if thermite wasn't the thing used to take down the towers, what did take down the towers? The quick answer is airplanes. <laughs> There's a really, really, really good and thorough analysis by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And according to their study, the two planes, when they crashed into the tower at full speed, did considerable damage, cutting through a good chunk of its infrastructure, but also did significant damage to the utility shaft. Now, that's a key thing because what it allowed is for jet fuel, um, the fuel in the planes that were all full to the gills because they were all uh, trans, uh, like they were all flights heading towards California. What this meant was not only was there a huge impact that sliced through a good chunk of the support structures of the plane, but then ignited liquid fuel just poured down all of the support systems of the building, setting everything on fire. It also cut all the braking mechanisms for the elevators. So the elevators came crashing to the ground and all of the fuel and fire beneath them poured into the lobbies of the buildings. And we have firsthand witnesses of this fuel coming down at high pressure, setting lots of things on fire, including lots of people. But you couldn't do that, the internet would say, because of the most famous line of the 9-11 truth movement, jet fuel can't melt steel beams. We got it, we did it, we got there, we said it, and this, is true. Jet fuel cannot melt steel beams because steel beams melt at 1,510 degrees Celsius and jet fuel burns at a temperature between four and 800 degrees Celsius. So you're dealing with at most generous, a 700 degree gap between the uh, temperature in which steel would melt and the hottest temperature that jet fuel can get to. And that seems like pretty damning evidence, but this is the step back video. Let's dig in. <laughs> First of all, it wasn't just jet fuel burning. The jet fuel caused a massive inferno inside of both buildings. Both buildings which were full of office furniture, wood, curtains, carpets, all sorts of stuff that can also burn. 
estimates show that uh, between the jet fuel and all of this office stuff catching fire, the temperature might have gotten as high as 1000 degrees Celsius, which doesn't quite get you to 1500 Celsius, but gets you a lot closer. But then there comes the very inconvenient fact for a lot of 9-11 truthers. Steel does melt at 1500 degrees Celsius, but at about 600 degrees Celsius, steel starts to lose its strength considerably to the point where after about 600 degrees Celsius, it loses half of its structural integrity. At about 1000 degrees Celsius, steel loses about 90% of its structural integrity. So yes, jet fuel couldn't melt the steel beams, but it could make them al dente. <laughs> Can't believe that joke made it through. So with everything established from the jet fuel fires and all of the inferno brought up, it is very likely they could have taken the steel and basically made it the consistency of well done spaghetti. And it was that weakness that caused the loss of structural integrity in the building. And there was a sort of cascading effect as uh, one floor fell onto the other, fell onto the other, fell onto the other. And you can imagine that that would cause a greater, greater um, escalation of the point of collapse to the point where then everything fell apart. Because um, buildings aren't designed to have jet planes filled with fuel crash into them at full speed. And as that would happen, the floor would crash onto the other and all of the air in that floor would pfft, be pushed out uh, the windows as the, as the pressure would be so high, the glass would basically shatter if it hadn't been shattered already by the heat and the air would come out in these big puffs of smoke. And sometimes that's pointed to as proof that it's an explosion because that's all the little bombs going off. But you can have explosions that work like that or you can have thermite, you can't have both. If the buildings were brought down by uh, bombs that worked that way, then it would have been a more traditional explosive and there would have been tons of evidence of that in the wreckage, which uh, I guess can all just be boiled down to the typical conspiracy line whenever they're cornered, which is just, that's what they want you to think, or you believe what the experts say? That was mistake number one. That, so that explains the two towers, but in the 2016 video, uh, as many commenters pointed out, I did insufficiently go into the example of uh, World Trade Center 7. It wasn't hit by a plane, but it also collapsed. Why is that? Must have been a conspiracy. Couldn't have been any other explanation. Oh no, here's an explanation. So yeah, World Trade Center 7 was another building that was right by the two World Trade Center buildings, and it too fell on 9-11 because of fire and structural damage caused by it. And it actually looks pretty convincing to be a uh, controlled demolition. It did a sort of collapse in a way that you see a lot of other buildings collapse where there's like one side that kind of went down in a whole way. Uh, if you did not know what you were looking at and you were only looking at it from one angle, it would look very controlled demolition-y. And it is true that World Trade Center 7 was not hit by a plane. It was hit by a building. <laughs> when the Twin Towers collapsed, a crap ton of debris fell on World Trade Center 7, taking out about 25% of the building and also caused massive infernos, which uh, again, rampaged through all of the office buildings and caused tons of structural damage on top of the structural damage. And even then the building stood for a further seven hours as fires burned unchecked through the building. Seven World Trade Center has been such a big deal uh, to the 9-11 conspiracy movement. Even in uh, recent-ish times, there was a whole movement to do an investigation into Building 7 to figure out what really happened. Uh, one of which led by Geraldo. <laughs> oh boy, when you're, when you're uh, relying on Geraldo, you know you've got some problems. But the conspiracy goes that maybe Building 7 was used as the operational center of it, or maybe uh, bracket, 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 La Larry Silverstein was hiding gold in it or something. You know, the, the motivations span the gamut depending upon what the conspiracy theorists, um, you know, cinematic universe that they believe to be true is. And yeah, it looks kind of controlled demolition-y because a lot of the damage was focused on one side of the building and that side collapsed first, which gave a sort of impression like a controlled demolition where one side kind of goes down a little bit before the others. The problem though, is that I've learned on the podcast, it's probably not aliens, probably not aliens .com, that a thing looking like a thing does not make the thing that thing. You know, this isn't a light bulb. This isn't an airplane and this isn't a controlled demolition. Aha, as a truther might point out at this point, this building collapsed due to fire? That has never happened in the history of architecture. 
There has never been a building that has collapsed due to fire. You might be onto something there, Truther. Fires had only ever caused collapse or partial collapse of steel structures that are a lot smaller than the World Trade Center. At that point. But here's the thing about time. It keeps going. And in 2017 in Tehran, a fire did take down a large steel building. The next year in Sao Paulo, another fire took down a steel building. <laughs> so not only did debris hit Building 7 and cause a ton of damage, it also caused a raging inferno that burned for seven hours. And it also appears that the damage of all the debris falling broke the uh, fire suppression system so none of the sprinklers went off, which means that they went unheated, which then burned up the office, caused a bunch of heat, and weakened the structural integrity of the building. You know, just like the other buildings had that day. The other thing too is that Building 7 is much closer to the ground, and uh, if there were signs of a controlled demolition, it would have been loud. It turns out explosions very loud, uh, 100 plus decibels loud, and we don't have any evidence of people hearing explosions in Building 7. So the main lines of argument that people use to make this claim come from a BBC report on the day that said uh, the collapse of Building 7 was imminent, as well as a uh, very ominous wording from the building's lease owner, uh, Larry Silverstein, saying to pull from the building, uh, which in demolition terms means to uh, essentially, uh, you know, blow up the building. The problem though is that in the fullness of time, the BBC who reported that Building 7 was imminently going to collapse uh, found out that they had been wrong in the chaos of the day where there was news stories second to second and they publicly apologized for making that mistake like the next day. Uh, furthermore, Larry Silverstein has pointed out in interviews uh, that he did that pulling out in that case um, did not mean blow up the building. Um, he pointed out that pull out at that point meant that uh, there were firefighters who were trying to put out the blaze in the building and they were basically fighting a losing battle at this point and they knew it. So the person who, you know, had the biggest stake in the building, the owner of the building said, all right, um, basically get your, get your people out of there, get the firefighters out of there. This building is basically toast. So it was basically like throwing in the towel, you know, pull, pull the people out. So that's all the stuff in New York, but what about the Pentagon? The Pentagon had some very suspicious things going on there as well. Um, the crash site in the Pentagon doesn't look like an airplane hit it. There's no holes for the wings. There's not that much good footage of the plane hitting uh, the Pentagon. So very often the people who believe that 9-11 was a false flag operation tend to claim that the Pentagon wasn't hit by a plane, but it was actually hit by a missile and that the plane that the government claims hit actually landed in Ohio and everybody aboard was just summarily executed. So let's let's get into each bit one at a time. So the first big claim is that, yeah, the hole in the Pentagon does look like it might have been too small for a 757 to barge through it. But according to civil engineering professor at Purdue University, Meet Sozin, A crashing jet doesn't punch a cartoon-like outline of itself into a reinforced concrete building. When Flight 77 hit the Pentagon, one wing hit the ground, and the other was sheared off by the Pentagon's load-bearing columns. There's also some conspiracy theorists who try to say that there was no wreckage of any airplanes uh, found at the Pentagon, which has been verified to not be true according to pretty much every eyewitness who was actually there. And there's also no good video files of the plane hitting the Pentagon, yes, because of a couple factors. One, it's a crime to film the Pentagon. I actually, in 2014, went to Washington, D.C. to see the 9-11 memorial at the Pentagon. And uh, I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting, but there is like a whole bunch of signs everywhere that basically says, you know, do not take pictures of the Pentagon because, you know, it's the center of the entire U.S. military force. So they have some, you know, security issues with uh, with you taking pictures there. So because of that, the only real evidence they have is security camera footage from a local gas station. And what they have is it's security camera footage. It's not exactly the most useful. <laughs> but there are tons and tons of eyewitness reports that do say that they did see an airplane hit the Pentagon. And that might not be the best line of evidence to go on, but it's the best we got. And there's certainly more people saying that they saw a plane hit the Pentagon than people who said they saw a missile hit it. The other thing too is that uh, the people who were aboard Flight 77, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, uh, were able to contact people. So, 
you might not remember this if you didn't fly in the late 90s, early 2000s, but before everyone had cell phones, there were phones on airplanes where like on the back headrest, uh, right above where the little screen with the in-flight movies would be, there was a phone and you could use that phone to make phone calls from the plane. It cost you an arm and a leg, but you could do it. And uh, people who were on board the plane at that time were using those phones to call loved ones, to tell them what had happened, that there had been hijackings. There was some issues with connections because you know there were hijackers aboard and it wasn't exactly a reliable technology, even at the best of times. But we have at least two verified cases of people calling loved ones to tell them that their plane had been hijacked. This is basically the only reason that we know how it happened. Uh, the Al-Qaeda hijackers at the time were able to board planes with box cutters and small knives, and they used those uh, to get around security and to uh, essentially, you know, hold people at knife point. And furthermore, after a FOIA request, the Pentagon actually did release security camera footage showing an airplane hitting the Pentagon. Or is that just what they want you to think? It's really hard to um, be a person who debunks conspiracy theory claims because Literally everything I say can just be rebutted in their minds with, well, that's just what they want you to think. Because while I am doing this to be very, very thorough, the end of the day, there's basically no actual logical way to convince these people if they don't want to be convinced. On that note, let's go to Flight 93. Flight 93 was the plane that uh, was headed for the Capitol building. They blew up Congress! <laughs> but the people on board the plane managed to overthrow their captors and uh, they crashed the plane in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where uh, there was a huge field of debris and a lot of, you know, a lot of destruction, everybody died. But yeah, it's just another event that was in the massive tragedy that was that day. So the way the conspiracy theory goes is that Flight 93 did not crash, but it was actually uh, shot down by a fighter jet. Main claims about this come from people like Alex Jones, who have claimed that uh, debris, like big chunks of debris, were found like a mile away from the crash site, which would have really only happened if it had exploded in the air. And the reason the government shot down this plane is because the people on board caught wise that this was a government plot and it needed to be taken down in order to uh, stop them from leaking all this information. This claim rests largely on unsupported assertions that the main body of the engine and other large parts of the plane turned up miles from the main wreckage site, too far away to have resulted from an ordinary crash. This claim is incorrect because the engine was found only 300 yards from the main crash site and its location was consistent with the direction in which the plane had been traveling. And a lot of the claims that uh, debris was found many miles away in a local Indian lake are true, but there's some caveats. One, uh, according to conspiracy theorists, this uh, is as far away as eight miles from the crash site. That's uh, not accurate. It's an eight mile drive from the crash site to Indian Lake, but it's only about a mile uh, as a crow flies or as the crashing Boeing 757 flies. And also a lot of this debris that was found a mile away is not like chunks of debris and fuselage. It's like papers and checks and bits of insulation and stuff like that. Things that very easily could have been caught up in the wind or in the updraft because of like, you know, fires and stuff like that. Stuff that could have very easily have blown away that far. This claim also rests on eyewitness accounts that there was a uh, plane, a white plane seen in the air around the crash site, which implies that that was the fighter jet that shot them down. And these reports are true. There was a plane in the air that was uh, flying actually fairly low looking over the crash site. Uh, the reason being is because they were asked to. It was essentially a private business jet that happened to be in the area. And uh, they were asked by the FAA if they could fly over the area to assess what was going on. So they were essentially uh, being asked by the government to go check out to see what had happened to Flight 93 and report back that basically it had crashed. And another thing that you can put up to the point for chaos that came in the days after 9-11 and the you know rush to report everything as fast as possible, there were some preliminary reports that Flight 93 had not crashed, that it had actually landed in Ohio, uh, but it very quickly turned out to be not Flight 93, but uh, Delta Flight 1989. And it was misreported and the story was retracted and reported as inaccurate. So, you know, that quickly 
should have rested it. But of course, nothing ever ends, Adrian. And it's also uh, interesting to point out that Valencia McClatchy, who was a local woman who took a photo of the mushroom cloud when the plane crashed, when Flight 93 crashed, um, has been intermittently harassed and threatened in the years since 9-11 for reportedly making a false picture of, of, of the thing that happened. But, my friends, you know what is hot enough to melt steel beams? This video's sponsor, adamandeve.com. Yeah, we're, we're going with, with that one. Not the easiest segue in the world, that's for sure. For almost 50 years now, Adam and Eve has been a very reputable and upstanding vendor of sensual adult products. Do you think, do you think YouTube will let me get that one by the censor? It's sex stuff. Because they've been in the business for almost 50 years, you know that they're going to be safe, they're gonna be reliable, and that they know what they're doing. So you know that with Adam and Eve, you're gonna get a very generous 90-day, no-hassle return policy, a top-tier customer service, and they go to great lengths to make sure that everything comes with discreet shipping. So your neighbors don't have to know anything about what you're ordering, and unless you open it up and look at what's inside, you would have no clue what it is or where it came from. And also really cool is that 20% of Adam and Eve's profits go to helping prevent the spread of HIV around the world, which if you guys know me, I made in 2018 a video about the HIV pandemic and it's a thing that, you know, means a lot to me. And so I really appreciate that they do that. So if you go to adamandeve.com and use the code step back, you're gonna get 50% off one item as well as free shipping to the US and Canada. I guarantee it's a deal that you'll never forget. A great way to spend your loose change. Thank you, Adam and Eve, for sponsoring this video, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so another uh, conspiracy claim that the government was trying to cover up uh, the 9-11 attacks and blame Al-Qaeda comes from uh, questions about these tapes that came out uh, supposedly made by Osama bin Laden claiming responsibility for them. And indeed, in December of 2001, uh, what's called the Jalalabad tapes uh, shows a person uh, who looks like Osama bin Laden claiming responsibility for the 9-11 attacks. Although uh, many people and some people who are, you know, reputable and independent have kind of pointed out that the translation that connects the two is a little dodgy at best and that this might be some disingenuous connections made by the United States. And this very well may be the case. The jury is not 100% settled on this, but the problem is that this isn't the only evidence we have linking Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda to the 9-11 attacks. Specifically, in 2007, bin Laden released an audio tape claiming responsibility for the attacks in a way to try and absolve Afghanistan, pointing out that the Taliban and Afghanistan were not aware uh, that 9-11 was being planned and that it happened. Also, Razmi bin al-Sheib and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, two architects of the 9-11 attacks, did an interview with Al Jazeera. And in this interview, they confessed to planning and executing the attacks of 9-11. There's also a few conspiracies claiming that in the past, the CIA tried to recruit several of the 9-11 hijackers. The CIA denies this. And so at the end of the day, this all comes out to a wash. It's, you know, he said, CIA said, whatever. Now, outside of the false flag operation, there is uh, theories that other governments were involved with 9-11, specifically to uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, let's just, let's start with Saudi Arabia. So the major claim about Saudi Arabia is that the royal family provided material support, possibly money, uh, to help the 9-11 attacks happen. It's complicated, but there may be some truth to this claim specifically. Uh, the United States is not gonna be very forthcoming about it because Saudi Arabia is a key strategic ally in the Middle East. And furthermore, it could happen because the Saudi royal family is very big, it's very complicated, and it's sort of hard for them to control where their money goes and to what. So it could be that there are members of the Saudi royal family, because the Saudi royal family is very big, that funneled money to Al-Qaeda to help 9-11 happen, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were uh, involved with the state or that you know the king or any of the official government had parts to do with it. This is what happens when you have a country that's just led by a giant family of oil barons. And also, if you were to look at the comments of my 2016 video, in the last two or three years, I think these are probably the last holdouts of the 9-11 truth movement at this point, are people who believe that 
Israel or just the Jews did 9-11. Essentially, the theory goes that either Mossad, which is sort of Israel's secret service, or Ariel Sharon, who was the leader of Israel at the time, plotted to uh, do 9-11 so that America would go to war with Middle Eastern countries and basically knock down their rivals. This conspiracy is very prominent in far-right and anti-Semite circles, obviously, as well as the comment sections of my old 9-11 Truther video, but it's also a fairly prevalent conspiracy belief in a lot of the Middle East. Now, there are two main things causing this. One was an incident where the FBI arrested a group of Israelis who seemed to be uh, in a suspiciously good mood on 9-11 and were filming uh, the World Trade Center. There was some suspicion that these people were uh, working on behalf of Israeli intelligence and were collecting information about what was going on that day. Although at the end of the day, it turns out it was just a couple dumb guys who had a moving company and were basically just... Uh, pulling out their camcorder and filming the chaos as it unfolded. But there are a lot of people who believe a second and more sinister thing that uh, Jewish employees were uh, told the day before to not go into work and that no Israelis or no Jews uh, died on 9-11. Some conspiracy theories put this number as high as 4,000 Jewish people didn't go into work on 9-11. The first report of this story seems to trace its elements back to um, Lebanon. Uh, specifically a Lebanese uh, television station who seemed to have taken it from a misreading of the Jerusalem Post. And what the Jerusalem Post article basically was, was a report from Israeli intelligence that uh, concluded that there were about 4,000 Jewish people who were in the vicinity of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on 9-11. But in reality, about between 270 and 400 Jews died in the September 11th attacks. Uh, the lower number of that, 270, would actually put it in line with the rough percentage of Jews uh, in their ethnic makeup of New York City. And furthermore, five Israeli citizens died in the attacks as well. And this conspiracy brings a lot of elements of a 19th century uh, book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is basically a anti-Semitic uh, forged uh, book that implies that, you know, the Jews are doing a secret um, plot to take over the world. It's, you know, at the root of a lot of 20th century anti-Semitism. It speaks to uh, what seems to be a fundamental truth whenever I dig into any conspiracy theory, which is that if you dig hard enough into any conspiracy movement, you eventually find anti-Semitism. <laughs> but yeah, looking at the big picture, Yes, Bush did benefit from the September 11th attacks. But also, every authoritarian regime benefited from the September 11th attacks. Israel used counterterrorism measures to crack down on Palestinians. Uh, China used anti-terrorism measures to crack down on Uyghur people. And Russia used anti-terrorism claims to crack down on Chechnyans. Pretty much every autocratic authoritarian regime used the wave of counterterrorism hysteria to crack down on dissidents within their population. Because states at their core want more power for themselves. And this situation was definitely exploited so that they could make as big a power grab for the state as they could. Not to be too anarchisty about it, but at the end of the day, most governments' worst enemy is their own people. Also, more than 20 years out, it seems very unlikely that the 9-11 attacks were planned by the government because in order to do such an operation would be a massive undertaking done by many people in various different places who in the decades since, not one has ever leaked the story to anybody ever. You know, nothing came out with Chelsea Manning's cable leaks. Nothing came out with uh, Edward Snowden's leaks. And through the democratic takeover of the US government in 2006 or, uh, or the Obama administration, or the second Obama administration, or the Trump administration, or even the Biden administration of right now, none of those governments have thought to gain some political points by exposing this massive uh, attack on their own people. And also at the end of the day, this is an operation that would be highly risky, and the stakes of it not working out and either getting botched or leaked would have resulted in several high profile American leaders essentially being uh, hung for treason. Um, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like the the calculus on that really works out in their favor. And a lot of the claims the 9-11 truth movement are like strange coincidences or things that are unexplained. But the problem with that is 
every big complex event is going to have those. 9-11 was a huge deal. Lots of stuff was going on. Lots of people were running around. There was chaos everywhere. It is almost guaranteed that there was going to be weird coincidences that happened or things that will forever go unexplained. It's sort of just how crazy events are. And so since we've had this long conversation, breaking down point after point after point, um, the thing that comes to mind is I'm very curious about why people believe these things. Why are people motivated or how do people get suckered into joining conspiracy movements? So I'm gonna break down uh, this using a more contemporary conspiracy theory that has the exact same amount of uh, legitimacy as the 9-11 truth movement, uh, the flat earthers. Cause as I've learned recently, as many as 11% of Americans believe that the earth is flat. I'm going to need a beer after that one. First of all, conspiracies becoming the norm are always going to lead to even more conspiracies becoming popular. Uh, there's a really great study of conspiracy movements that shows that the number one thing that will predict that somebody will believe in a conspiracy theory is if they believe in a different conspiracy theory. There is a certain conspiratorial thinking that appeals to that personality type. And so you find in Flat Earthers, a lot of them are associated with other uh, conspiracy movements. In uh, Dan Olson's wonderful video about Flat Earthers, he points out that uh, pretty much everyone who was involved with the Flat Earth movement at its peak have all moved on to QAnon. Uh, and I believe that's kind of where they are now. And also with the Flat Earthers, you see what happens, and this definitely happened with the 9-11 Truth Movement, is that they spread by entering into culture wars of the moment and attaching themselves to different sides. Because when we're talking about culture wars, people are usually willing to grab onto any and all evidence they can to make their case, even if the evidence is, you know, half-baked and doesn't really work for them. This is why I get particularly irked at like the Chapo Trap House people because they, uh, you know, they're leftists, which, you know, I sympathize with obviously as one myself, but then uh, they embrace a bunch of ridiculous conspiracy theories because, um, you know, the, conspiracy that uh, the government assassinated JFK or uh, that, you know, Bush did 9-11 um, helps make their case easier. And because they want to grab onto anything that supports their case, grab onto that. And that happens with Flat Earthers uh, in the sort of uh, battle against secularization that's happening. The idea that, um, you know, God is leaving society and uh, moving to a more scientific secular world and uh, flat earthers latch on to the backlash against that. For the 9-11 truth movement, it was obviously the culture war about uh, Bush and uh, the Bush administration and the war on terror. Uh, people probably don't know this from uh, now, but at the time, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were highly polarizing. While most people acknowledge that they were a mistake today, uh, there was a lot of debate and a lot of uh, Republicans and conservatives and even liberal Democrats uh, supported the wars and that opposing the wars was uh, kind of countercultural and uh, trying to make the claim that, you know, you wanted to that you opposed the war on terror, you opposed the invasion of Iraq um, would, um, would 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 be helped if you also like kind of were able to bolster it if you were unscrupulous by saying, well, also, you know, the whole premise of the war on terror was a lie too. Because when you make your side of an argument your identity, it steadfasts your opinion and essentially uh, makes it so that no amount of evidence or argumentation will back you out of these assertions. Flat earthers and 9-11 truthers also can pit themselves as lone, uh, rogue, you know, do-gooders fighting against the evil elites that are trying to either obscure the truth about the world in one way or the other, right? And oftentimes a big motivator for these conspiracy theories is just racism, you know, racism or hatred against immigrants, Jews, Muslims, racial minorities of various kinds, you know, name your scapegoat, right? And in that case, we're not really going to be able to talk them 
out of these positions. They're very much emotional in their need. There's a emotional satisfaction of getting absorbed into a conspiracy movement. That's why I think so many people uh, still watch conspiracy content uh, because they, quote, just find it interesting or fun to watch. It's very often a radical reinterpretation of events in a way that makes them more exciting uh, and implies more order in the world than actually exists because I think it's more anxiety inducing to believe that there is nobody in control. Uh, the world is just chaos. And it's much more reassuring in a weird way to be like, oh, no, no, everything that is bad that's happening, it's not because of impersonal forces of economics and, uh, and, and such. But no, it has more to do with a specific group of minorities that I don't like that we are going to target. And if we take them out, then things will be better. Conspiracies also make you feel like you're smarter than everybody else. You feel like you are uh, beholding uh, forbidden knowledge. Very often conspiracy theorists um, will trust a source more the less reputable it is uh, because they will believe that it is a uh, maverick, you know, uh, fighting information from the little guy. Uh, this is basically how the entire Joe Rogan experience works. Basically everything Joe Rogan just latches on and believes the dumbest things he hears because he thinks that if 99% of people are saying something and 1% is saying another thing, that that 1% guy must be on to something. And by doing that, they claim that they are being critical thinkers. There is a very emotionally satisfying smug superiority by believing that you, you know the truth and everybody else are just sheeple. There's also just the satisfaction of like solving a puzzle. You know, conspiracy movements take very disparate things and try to make these connections. It's almost like an ARG or something like that, where there's all of these little clues in all these different places and it's just up to you to piece them together. And once you do, and it all makes sense in your head, you can, it blows your mind. Uh, QAnon is basically this. QAnon is essentially a neo-fascist movement that is led by uh, an ARG or an alternate reality game that used to go through uh, 4chan, 8chan, one of the chans. I don't know where it is now, but um, there is a satisfying gamey aspect to it. And also at the end of the day, there are some grains of truth to conspiracy theories. They're not just built on nothing. There are elites in our society who feel like they're above the law. There are people like Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos, for example. <laughs> so if you find yourself uh, dealing with a conspiracy theorist, what do you do? How do you argue with them? Well, just know that their uh, approach and their thinking about these things is very different. And you can't just like uh, correct them with fact checking or with uh, any sort of evidence. You have to go and approach them on their own level. For example, any argument from authority, just ignore it. Uh, no government scientist or any government sort of reports are ever going to be believed. It's always just what they want you to think, right? So in order to prove things in a more concrete way, you might have to propose like an at-home experiment that anybody could do, something that they can see with their own eyes. You can also look to whatever side of the culture war, what part of their identity that they're clinging on to this conspiracy theory to uphold, and try and make the counter argument that uh, they can have the ethics that they want, but not buy into the conspiracy theorist. Like, you know, if I could uh, get a wish from a genie, I would probably try to convince a lot of people that, you know, you can oppose uh, the systems of hierarchy and the imperialism of the American dominated world without believing in conspiracy theories uh, that they about what they do. That, that, that you can have both, both of those things can be true at the same time. Or for example, for your flat earther, you can say, you know, you don't have to believe in a flat earth to be a religious person. Those aren't necessary at the same time. There are plenty of very religious, evangelical even, uh, people who still very much believe in the round earth. Plus, you know, to really get it in at the end, a lot of conspiracy theories are held up by group identities that feel like they're under attack, which could be addressed by, say, improving people's material conditions by reducing the precarity that everybody feels and the low-level anxiety that is overcoming all of us because we're all being ground to uh, death by capitalism while we play this uh, game of Hungry Hungry Hippos where less and less marbles are left on the table and two people have everything that... Uh, the work of our species has fought so hard to get.
Like, share, and subscribe.